Uh, we are here in Bangkok where negotiators from 16 countries are meeting at the 23rd round of negotiations for the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership and several groups are here in Bangkok monitoring uh, the trade round. Uh, we joined here by Joseph Puruganan from Focus on the Global South and Susanna Barria from Public Services International. Uh, welcome to NewsClick and People's Dispatch. Let me start with you, Joseph. Um, the RCEP round is happening at a time when uh, global trade deals seem to be in a crisis and many countries seem to be withdrawing uh, from trade deals. You see it with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Why is it that the RCEP continues to be in negotiation mode and what does it uh, hold for Asia? We need to, I think, situate the RCEP talks in the, in the broader context. There's, I, we, we feel there's a geopolitical dimension to these negotiations of these mega FTA negotiations. Because on the one hand, you have RCEP, 16 countries centered around ASEAN and its developing develop, uh, partners, China, India, Australia, New Zealand. But um, we're also seeing like the, the negotiations for Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is U.S.-led, many fields U.S.-led. And then the EU is also pushing for its own model of uh, free trade agreement. So if you look at it from that geopolitical lens, you see that there's a, there's a battle going on among the main major superpowers for who gets to define the, uh, the trade rules. No? Uh, so RCEP, for a while it was viewed as a China-led agreement because uh, it's a way to counterbalance the transatlantic you know, US and EU influence in the region. But as we've seen, um, countries like Japan and Korea that are also negotiating as part of uh, TPP have, in fact, um, pushed the agenda for uh, an ambitious agenda more um, aggressively in these talks. Why is it important? Um, like I said, Asia is at the center of these negotiations. And I think there are at least three reasons why Asia is at the center. One is that it's, it's a, it's a fast-growing region. It's a big market. And um, I think the motivations, you have to go back to the financial crisis. No? The developed countries are looking for ways to expand the market, new markets, right? And so they're driven by that, the need to export more to a region that is growing. Countries like Laos, uh, Cambodia, Philippines are growing at a fast pace, 6%, 7%. So there's that interest to capture that Asian market. Second reason, I think, is access of resources. So part of that uh, struggle among the superpowers is who gets to access the resources. And this um, question of resources is vital to the competitiveness of these big powers. The EU says that it can, uh, its competitiveness is hinged on its ability to secure cheaper uh, raw materials. So, and th these deals facilitate that uh, access to raw materials. And the third re reason is China. Uh, I think the, there's a U.S. pivot to Asia that is in the military sense, but there's also an economic pivot. And part of that is really to how to counterbalance the increasing influence of China in the region. So I think those three issues are really what's motivating uh, these negotiations. So like Joseph said, it's 16 countries, some of them developed, some of them developing. The negotiations have been going on for the last five years, 23 chapters. Uh, can you highlight some of the concerns uh, in terms of uh, your organization? So from the perspective of PSI, one of the big concerns we have is obviously how it's going to impact labor and workers in the region. And we feel that um, many provisions, many aspects of what is there in the proposal for an RCEP are going to impact employment, uh, either because they are going to be more imports because of lower tariffs that will lead to job losses, or because by losing certain policy tools, um, again, tariff itself is a policy tool, but also through um, having um, constraints on the kind of 
request what can make on investment when there are foreign direct investment coming. Um, this will have an impact also on the ability to create employment in the future. So these are very valid concerns in a context where there is a crisis of employment in many of the countries in the region. Another concern is also the impact it can have on wages. Um, when there is more competition, very often companies see um, reducing the wage wages of workers as a way to decrease the cost. So more competition will create a push to the bottom. Um, informalization is another consequence because there is more use, there is a possibility of more use of um, contract work. We are also worried that it will have um, an impact on people's ability to access public services. In the region already, uh, governments are not um, putting enough money in public services so that we can have good quality healthcare, good quality um, electricity provi provided for everyone. Um, there is also different places where water is being privatized and um, the um, parts of the agreements that are related, for instance, to services make it much more difficult to regulate the private sector, make that one cannot reverse a privatization that has taken place. Um, and that is really worrying because we have seen that many often privatization has failed. Um, it's failed in the ability to provide services to people who need them. And uh, there are lots of constraints on how governments can regulate in terms of being able to promote the public interest. Uh, and that's a, that's a very important concern also. And overall, I think um, the concern is that it's the package that the, the agreement provides that has a direction, a clear intent to ensure that governments cannot regulate investments and that want to guarantee rights and profits for companies. Talking about uh, regulation, Joseph, one of the more controversial elements, especially in the recent um, you know, trend of mega FTAs, has been the investment chapter. Um, and many countries within RCEP have been uh, you know, backtracking on, uh, on investment rules. What is the status of the investment chapter and what are your concerns on it? Yeah, RCEP is a new generation FTA, uh, it, which means that it's uh, not just dealing, we're not dealing here with simple elimination of tariffs or market access issues. And one of the more contentious, as you said, is investments. And uh, there are at least two big uh, issues under that. One is the prohibition of performance requirements. So uh, performance requirements, as you know, like a local content policy, uh, local labor policy, these are used by governments as a policy instrument to push development, you know, national development. But these agreements would limit the power of, would actually prevent governments from using these policy tools. Uh, the second is the, consider the toxic element of this agreement is the investor state dispute settlement, which gives power to corporations to, to sue governments in uh, undemocratic uh, and non-transparent uh, investment tribunals. And so we feel that the investment chapter really reflects uh, the corporate agenda that is underpinning uh, these talks. But if I may add on the, the concerns, Benny, uh, for ASEAN, a big concern is the, the asymmetry in development. So we're negotiating, six, these are 16 countries negotiating. China is, uh, of course, a very powerful country. And, uh, but you have countries like least developed countries like Laos, Myanmar, Cambodia, who are, uh, you know, the economies, the national income of these countries are less than 1% of that of China. And so there's a big concern that um, who would benefit from this agreement? Will, the, will this agreement be able to um, pull up the economies of these least developed countries? Or will the um, interest of uh, richer countries like China, Australia, Singapore be the one that dictating the agenda of this negotiation? So that asymmetry is, uh, is an important concern. There's also a concern over intellectual property rights and, um, and its impact on medicines and public health. Uh, there are provisions in the intellectual property rights chapter uh, that are TRIPS plus provisions that would, uh, the fear is that these uh, provisions would actually delay 
the availability of cheaper or a more affordable generic medicines. Yeah. So, and there's also uh, part of the IPR concerns also have to deal with uh, farmers and farmers' rights to cultivate seeds because the one implication of uh, signing on to this agreement with its IPR provision is that countries are forced to actually uh, comply with UPOV 91, which is a plant variety protection legislation that many farmers are um, uh, have said would re really restrict the ability of farmers uh, and farmers' rights over not just seed but their whole production. So if you say that peasants are not going to benefit, patients are not going to benefit, the LDCs are not going to benefit, can you both speak a bit about then who's driving the negotiations, uh, especially uh, within the bigger countries, which are the key sort of corporate actors that are trying to push uh, the ASEP forward? So linking this question also with the question of concerns, um, one of the things we have seen is that the negotiations of the agreement have been held in secrecy and that the um, text of the negotiations, the content, the positions of countries have not been put in the public have not been shared with elected representatives, have not been shared also with, for instance, uh, trade unions, which are representatives um, that generally have tripartite mechanisms in which government discuss important issues. But this agreement, despite its impact on labor, is not part of those tripartite spaces. And this is a serious concern that raises the question of whose interests are being um, promoted. And we can see that there is a certain group that has been having direct and privilege access to the negotiators, and these are the big corporations in the region. Um, there are companies, for instance, in the dairy sector in Australia that have been quite involved, companies in the pharmaceutical sector from Japan. So as uh, what Susanna said, no, the, I think the main drivers really are the big, corporate, big corporations and the big corporate lobby who have been given privilege access to these negotiations. Uh, so large big-scale mining companies, uh, agribusiness companies, big pharma. You know, these are the companies that, would, that are really driving the, the negotiations, in fact, influencing the, the direction of the talks. Uh, and so they stand to benefit the most, I think. Uh, thank you for speaking to NewsClick and People's Dispatch. That's all the time we have, and we hope to come back to you at some point to look at what the status of the RCEP is. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.